Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, this webinar is about to begin. Um, I would like to welcome you all to the final session of the Erasmus Coast Digital Series for this year uh, with this autumn webinar. Um, this webinar is directed at dashboard users, and in the afternoon, we will also have a session uh, for use of third party software and in house systems. Um, so, just that you are aware. Um, given that we have a very full agenda, um, I think we should dive straight in. Um, I think we have all come to understand webinars over the past few years, uh, perhaps more than we would have liked. Um, as a reminder, you can ask questions in the Q&A and we will try to answer as much as possible. So without further ado, I would first like to welcome our co colleagues from the European Commission. Um, today we are joined by Jan Mel Bido, who is a policy offer, officer at DG Education and Culture. We are also joined by Harpa Sif Arnos Arnars Dotir, um, who came aboard as the ABP Relationship Manager. Um, and I'm also very welcome, uh, very pleased to welcome Vanessa Debiet Senton, um, who is the head of unit higher education at DG Education and Culture at the European Commission. Um, so I think we will start um, with some words of welcome. Um, so Vanessa, uh, I don't know if you can hear me, or is it Jan Mael who will? Uh... I will start. I will start. Yes. I can hear you. Yes. Welcome. All right. Um, so yeah, then I will shut up and give the floor to you so that you can begin. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David. And uh, good morning, everyone. It is uh, a pleasure to be here with all of you today and mostly to listen uh, to you and to your feedback about this uh, very important uh, initiative that is the European Student Card Initiative. It all uh, started um, five years ago, a bit more actually, by a group of high education institutions who dreamed about digitalizing all the um, Erasmus Plus administrative process to facilitate student exchanges and Erasmus Plus student exchanges. And actually, um, following a, a research at that time, back then it was quite supported by the higher education community with the objective to facilitate and simplify the management of student mobilities across Europe. And it has received a lot of political attention uh, including by the Commission, but not only, also by the Council and the European Parliament. Um, and this is in line with the broad political uh, commitments to uh, create a European education area by 2025, where all learners can move seamlessly across Europe to receive the best education and training. And in order to to, to achieve this objective, it's always good to have uh, pioneers, and, and this is what we expect from the European Universities Initiative, with the objective of organizing seamless mobility for at least 50% um, of their student body. So this is a very important objective, a challenging one as well, that requires um, support and facilitation of the organization uh, from an industry point of view of all these mobilities. And this is where the European Student Car Initiative is, is, um, is so important um, to make it work uh, with the objective to facilitate these mobilities through a fully digital and seamless process. We have, under the French presidency, adopted uh, European Council conclusions in April 2022, where the member states invite the Commission to um, simplify, to work together with the higher education community to simplify this administrative process for higher education institutions, including through the further development of the European Student Card Initiative. So this is where we are, a lot of uh, political ambition with this uh, initiative. At the same time, we know that uh, connecting more than 5,000 
IT systems in the higher education institutions comes with a number of challenges. And that is why we listen to you before the summer to take stock on where we were, where the, the challenges and the difficulties were. And we have asked the, w, the EWP, the Erasmus Without Paper Consortium, to come up with an interoperability action plan, as we understood by listening to you that interoperability were the main challenging issues at that time. And I would like to really thank the Erasmus Without Paper Consortium for all the hard work that they have been doing over the past months together with all of you. And I think we can be very happy with all the collective progress that have been made since then. And that is why today and until the end of the year, we would like to take stock of all this progress and again listen to you um, before taking any decision uh, for the further development and the next steps. So, as I said, a lot, a lot of uh, commitment and progress has been made thanks to all of you and to the EWP consortium. Um, we can see that uh, that now uh, about 100% of higher education institutions having an Erasmus Plus charter are now connected to the Erasmus Without Paper Network with about 90% of high education institutions that are connected to exchange and agree on the inter-institutional agreements and the learning agreements together, together with issuing a European student identifier that helps with facilitating and simplifying this process. So as I said, thanks to this real, real collective effort, and here I would like to really thank all of you, we have almost multiplied by 10 the number of inter-institutional agreements and learning agreements that have been signed by all parties in a couple of months, so between July and, and October this year, which is really, really uh, a great progress because, of course, um, in this process of digitalization, we are all dependent on each other. Uh, if uh, uh, a high education institution is ready, it cannot still work before all its partners are ready. So that's why this huge um, improvement in the connection and in the exchange of these agreements is um, a huge collective effort and it goes really, really in the, in the right direction. It looks very, very encouraging. So, um, and, and, uh, and now uh, you, you have at your disposal, so we heard before the summer about the need to um, develop uh, um, a portal for this European Student Initiative, which we have launched a couple of weeks ago. And we hope that this will answer some of uh, your expectations that we heard um, before the summer. So our objective with this portal is to provide a one-stop shop for everyone who want to know more about this initiative, but also to find all the information that you need in a transparent way to be able to connect and to proceed with all these um, steps when organizing student mobility. So um, now basically um, we are at a, at a point where only a minority of higher education institutions are still uh, experiencing difficulties and uh, as you know it's very important for us to not leave anyone behind so that's why we will um, really together with the Erasmus Without Paper Consortium follow a targeted approach with these remaining higher education institutions to make sure that all of them receive all the support they need to be able to connect, not only to be able to connect, but also to share um, the agreements digitally. So that is really our objective for the months to come to complete the interoperability action plan as it has been devised before the summer. 
and to make sure that no one is left behind and get the targeted support that they need. And this includes um, a closer monitoring of some specific nodes to remaining ones that are still reporting errors. And you can find all this information available transparently on the portal to know what are your partners that are connected to systems that works and those that are connected to a system that is still experiencing problems. So as I said, our objective today is to really together with my colleagues, uh, Jan Mayen and Harpa, and also with all the colleagues from the EWP consortium is to provide today a state of play of all the progress that has been made. And I think we can all be very proud of all the, the, the collective progress that has been made over the past months, but also to take stock of where we are and um, what are the next steps that are necessary to be taken so that all of you and all of us can really benefit uh, from this uh, European Student Card Initiative. So we are here to really listen to you and, uh, and uh, we have now put in place a new governance so that um, all key stakeholders, including higher education institutions, have a say in the decision process for the next steps. So I will now switch to a listening mode and give the floor to, to my colleagues to provide you with this state of play. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vanessa, uh, and hello, everyone. For those who don't know me, I'm Jan Mel I work in the same unit as Vanessa, and I have the pleasure to be coordinator for the European Student Card Initiative. And as Vanessa indicated, I will repeat some of her messages and uh, focus on the, the state of play of where we are at this very, uh, at this moment and the implementation of this uh, ambitious initiative. So uh, about the digitalization progress, uh, you have all heard that we have set uh, this target uh, for the end of the year to achieve full interoperability and uh, transition to digital management of in new interinstitutional agreements and learning agreements. Uh, and this uh, target date uh, remains our target. Uh, this is why we have uh, created this interoperability action plan to make sure that by the end of the year, we can achieve uh, a system that enables uh, full interoperability and that you as users will be able to use it with all your partners as from next year. Now, the question, is very often uh, rose uh, of what happens to those agreements that were concluded on paper or via emails uh, before uh, the end of the year. Well, the answer is that they remain valid uh, for the duration of, uh, of uh, for their duration for the validity duration, and we 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 know that institutions will need time to transition these agreements that were concluded on paper or on email to digital ones. Uh, this is why we are not setting a, a date now for this transition. We want to first uh, sit and listen to everyone, to the stakeholders, and this will be done through the uh, Erasmus Without Paper governance structure, where we'll commonly reflect on when will be the most appropriate time to do this transition uh, in the future. In 2023, we really want to focus on uh, solving the remaining technical issues uh, in case some uh, higher education institutions still experience problems despite the interoperability action plan with their uh, mobility management software or with issuing the European Student Fire, for example. And for that reason, since we really want to focus on providing support to the users, to the higher education institutions, the uh, Erasmus Charter uh, monitoring will also focus on the efforts made by the higher education institutions uh, to try to, to, to exchange digitally. And as Vanessa mentioned, nearly 100% of higher education institutions have are connected on the, on, the, uh, on the network, which is already a very good sign of efforts that were put into this. And uh, national uh, Erasmus Plus national agencies will be asked to uh, focus on providing further guidance when needed when higher education institutions uh, still 
face some difficulties. So the focus will really be on providing assistance uh, rather than um, punishment, if I would say, and uh, this is not how we see things. As, as Vanessa already mentioned, the result of the action plan uh, can already be seen. Uh, this is very promising. We have an enhanced service desk that is operational uh, and that you can contact for, for your questions, uh, for your issues. Uh, we're conducting also proactive debugging uh, in uh, line with the interoperability action plan. There will be uh, details about this effort that will be provided in an assessment report that is to be presented uh, very soon. We have just finalized uh, the, 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 the report, so it will be ready to be published in a very short time. We also want to have more structured uh, stakeholder consultation, cooperation, uh, because we believe this is key for uh, the system to function in the most efficient way. This is why we have set a new governance structure in place. This is why we also have uh, these town hall meetings uh, for an open dialogue uh, that uh, two of them were already had this year with uh, quite high participation where everyone can come and ask any question uh, they may have for the Erasmus Without Paper Consortium or for representatives of the European Commission. We have um, Erasmus Without Paper mandatory business requirements uh, for agreements that uh, are ready and that will also uh, be published very shortly. And we have hired three relationship managers uh, that have for a uh, role, main role, to follow closely the implementation of third party software providers in house systems to make sure that no one is uh, penalized by the fact that he, he, uh, they cannot connect to partners using different systems that may not be working as well uh, in, the, in the network than, than their own. When it comes to the future and moving forward together, um, it's as Vanessa already mentioned, we have not set a target date now for implementation of nomination of transcript of record in Erasmus with that paper. Why is that? Because we think it's important to take into consideration uh, your views, that it's important to take into consideration implementation in the ground and make sure that if there is any timeline that is to be set, it actually uh, is co-created with the stakeholders, with the users, so as to make sure that the system is fit for purpose when uh, institutions are asked to use it. And this is also why we want to conduct uh, more robust testing beforehand, and that will be uh, carried out before confirming any indicative timeline within the uh, governance structure. We will set a new priority uh, actions uh, to follow the conclusion of the action plan and they will be formulated together uh, again within the with the governance structure and we aim to have several uh, sessions at the AIE conference with an AAC stand uh, hopefully this will be a good forum to exchange uh, information have direct contact uh, exchange uh, physically also uh, with you uh, with higher education institutions and discuss together on the future of this of this initiative. Vanessa already mentioned it. We have launched an information portal. We heard the feedback that sometimes information uh, was hard to find uh, or located in different places. And the goal of this information portal on the European Student Card Initiative is to gather all important uh, pieces of information in one place and in a more structured way. We, want, we will continue to feed this portal. You won't find already all the information in there. This is something uh, in progress, uh, but more and more content will be added uh, as, as time comes. And we also want to start building a positive narrative around uh, this initiative uh, and using what we would call digital champions. So those of you for whom uh, the Erasmus Without Paper brought uh, some a lot of benefits uh, that improved uh, the way you are working, uh, that uh, we want to showcase uh, the efforts that you made and share your success stories. And we uh, want to, to use your stories uh, to build this narrative around the initiative. 
Uh, we also have uh, in mind that these digital champions could support uh, and use testing of any new development before they are made available to the community. If you are interested uh, to become one of those digital champions, please do not hesitate to get uh, do not hesitate to get in touch with us, as uh, we are now trying to identify those. So it would be indeed uh, very very well appreciated if you would uh, be willing to to be one of those and share those stories with us. So this is it for me, uh, and I will now pass the floor to the. Uh, consortium for the rest of the webinar. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Jan Mael and, and Vanessa. Um, I think some of the things that were mentioned uh, are going to be followed up for followed up on by the next speaker, um, which is Paul Lace from the University of Ghent, who is task leader for communication and outreach, um, and he will present the ABP assessment report. Welcome, Paul. I hope you can hear me. We can see your screen at least. Yes, thank you, David. That's uh, already good news. And I will indeed uh, speak about the EWP assessment report. And um, Jan, Meil and Vanessa already uh, referred to the interoperability reinforcement plan, which was a, a very important step, I think, towards um, making um, the, the whole interinstitutional agreements and learning agreements work better. It was based on, on a lot of feedback we also received from, from uh, one of the earlier webinars and, and directly via other channels as well. And as part of this uh, interoperability reinforcement plan that uh, started uh, during summer of 2022, we also wanted to, to take stock about uh, where we are today. And this was the deliverable uh, about the EWP assessment report that I would like to uh, shortly introduce uh, also today during this, uh, this webinar. Now, what are we access assessing uh, exactly? Um, we want to assess whether EWP works. And um, there's, there's, there's a lot of, of um, different views about EWP about interinstitutional agreements, uh, exchanges that might or might not be successful. Um, and here we, we would like to contribute to the collective understanding of what is actually working and what not. Um, of course, all taking from the perspective of, of the end users who need to uh, try to complete the processes online. Um, and why why was was it needed in our in our view? Because um, we've we've already experienced that the digital transition has been hard for for many of us many universities and iros have have tried their very best to uh, to deal with the digital transition but of course this is not only about the interoperability itself about seamlessly exchanging data between two systems it's also about uh, adapting internal processes because where in the past we we had uh, pdf uh, documents or even paper documents about uh, agreements that we then shared with our partners uh, via email or, or even via the regular mail and now of course this is a, a, a completely different story where um, you receive data from your partner and then you should also um, have some steps to be taken in order to, to uh, assess whether or not this is the right um, content of an agreement. Uh, should we send it back? Should we keep the same agreement? Uh, we, we, we shall approve. So it, it's not only about EWP exchanges, it's also about um, what happens before you press the button in order to send it to your partner and what, what, what happens uh, after you receive the data sets. And so in that regard, there's, there's a whole lot of challenges uh, that universities and IRO faced throughout um, the last couple of years. It's also um, the case that um, usually IROs who are often involved in this process uh, they see if something doesn't work, but they doesn't they they don't know why it, it it's not working. Um, you can compare it with with a, a water pipe leakage where you can still get water out of the tap, but somewhere it might be that there might be an issue, and and you need a plumber or or some expert in order to find out what's actually happening. And 
Um, I think uh, here it's a bit of the same situation. You trust, or, or we need to trust that once you um, complete the process internally, and you want to um, send data over to EWP, you need to, to trust that the data is also well received on the other side. And um, that's one of the one of the important issues uh, we faced throughout the, the last couple of months. And that also the interoperability reinforcement plan was created for in order to uh, make sure that um, IROS can trust the system um, as it were. And we also uh, find it or found it uh, essential to pin down the problems um, and challenges as accurate as possible. Um, so therefore, um, we created this, uh, this, this assessment report as part of this uh, action plan. Of course, when, when we uh, needed to start this exercise, um, it's, it, it's based on information that we have available. And, and you will have already noticed probably that more and more um, actions have been taken by the EWP consortium, like the SK service desk that was presented at earlier webinars. Um, there's also uh, the governance structure with, with some uh, representation from the end users community, the, the so-called business process owner uh, forum with the standing expert group. Uh, there's also the general information about connections uh, in the network. Uh, recently, uh, the EWP Stats portal was launched, and this will also be discussed later on in this webinar. Um, there, there is uh, specific actions from the interoperability plan, like the proactive debugging, which might sound very technical, but actually it's, it's um, the technical team that's supporting EWP that is looking for issues uh, that, that affect uh, interoperability, uh, try to find solutions and discuss it with um, nodes who are causing such issues. And there were also technical workshops in Warsaw where developers came together and sat together and, and tried uh, the exchanges live, also identifying maybe some minor or, or major issues uh, still at hand. So based on all these sources, uh, we had a, a much better view on what's going on in the network. Um, we can also look into what has already been achieved, what has already been done. And um, in the beginning of, of the 2022 year period, where, as you know, the, the um, structural funding for the initiative via uh, framework contract came into focus. At first, we really focused on maintenance and, and enhancements. And um, many of you being EWP dashboard users already experienced those enhancements, maybe very visible or more behind the scenes. But there, there has a lot of work been and, and efforts put in, in, in making uh, this, this um, user experience better. Um, and, and this will cum culminate, of course, in, in um, the, the enhanced uh, user interface uh, of the uh, EWP dashboard, but um, this will also be discussed later in the presentation. We put the service desk in place where um, you can, if you, if you experience an issue uh, with sending or receiving agreements or learning agreements, or you have another uh, technical issue in the dashboard, you can go there and, and um, add a new um, issue or ticket. And this will be followed up then by a team that is working very actively uh, on the improvement of um, the, the infrastructure. Um, there's also um, more intensified technical testing from the EWP dashboard uh, team, which is the reference implementation in EWP, uh, by the way, um, that is completely in line with the technical specifications. And here um, we also um, are in a position to, to be open to newcomers who, who would like to test their uh, implementation, whether it's it's uh, compliant with the specifications as well, but also those that were already part of the network. Uh, we do uh, retesting has been taken uh, care of in order to improve this this whole uh, interoperability ecosystem. And last but not least, um, a new governance structure has been uh, put in place, and I, I hope you will be happy. Uh, to hear uh, Jan Lyle also addressing it um, when, when discussing priorities or, or when discussing the digitization uh, timeline, that it's also crucial 
that this uh, this governance structure will provide European Commission with the necessary information about how um, EWP implementation is going and and what what kind of priorities the community sees in order to to further um, digitize the the administration of the Erasmus program. Um, from May until June, uh, we started um, defining the, the plan uh, that has been addressed already several times. Um, and there was also a very, very interesting finding about the issues in terms of interoperability that were more affecting interinstitutional agreements than learning agreements. When it comes to learning agreements, based on all the sources that, that, that I, I mentioned on one of the previous slides, uh, we didn't find uh, uh, any major blocking interoperability issues with the majority of the nodes in the network. Um, although we still uh, face a number of uh, learning agreements not being completed, but at least the data exchanges when it comes to EWP seem to work. Um, so uh, it would be it would be also interesting to zoom more into why why is the completion rate maybe a little bit lower? Uh, of course, um, sometimes a new learning agreement is created and shared, and so so this is the kind of issues we further need to zoom into. But at least in the, from the interoperability perspective, they seem to work uh, much better than for interinstitutional agreements. It's also it, it also became clear from the proactive debugging um, that most of the blocking issues were connected to interinstitutional agreements. This proactive uh, debugging took place from June until uh, today, October onwards, and it will also uh, we will also continue uh, doing this exercise in order to try to identify uh, blocking issues uh, in the network. And I already mentioned the technical workshops that were also important to take stock of the situation. Now, how far have we come? I think Vanessa uh, already uh, indicated the very large percentage of higher education institutions that is already connected to EWP. And here it's also important to stress that um, it's the percentage from the target population and the target population at the moment um, are the institutions that have applied for a project, um, including student mobility for studies, because you're all aware that, of course, once you, you want, before you want to exchange students under the student mobility for students, uh, the student mobility for uh, studies actions, um, that uh, there needs to be an interinstitutional agreement uh, in place. Later on in the process, also a learning agreement is a mandatory element in this in this whole exchange process. So that's uh, why it's important to understand that from the target population, so we're almost uh, at 100% institutions connected. If we look into uh, the specific processes of um, interinstitutional agreements, we're above 95%. For learning agreements, we're at almost 90% of uh, those target population institutions connected to the network. It's also worth mentioning that um, more than 90% of the higher education institutions are issue issuing already a European student identifier. And of course, it goes without saying that this is a huge uh, achievement from the community. It's, it's of course you who, who did all the efforts in order to get connected and to get uh, starting uh, exchanges. But um, from, from the assessment report, it's also very important to understand where are we from, from this perspective. Um, also work have been uh, carried out in order to, um, to, to solve some, um, some, some issues. For example, um, when it comes to cooperation conditions per interinstitutional agreement, this has been uh, solved. Uh, it's something that affected thousands of agreements and, and institutions. And I hope, especially also as dashboard user, I know that this has caused a lot of issues for you uh, when, when your partner was uh, creating separate agreements for incoming students, for outgoing students, for incoming staff, for outgoing staff. And now at least this is uh, more uh, taken together in, 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 in terms of agreements. So I hope this is also a relief from uh, the number of agreements in the dashboard and that you can continue working um, with, with not, not with those separate agreements, but with more consolidated agreements. We also saw a considerable increase of, of interinstitutional agreements and learning agreements completed over the, the last three months. 
um, and also an in increasing number of third party providers being able to successfully exchange e EEAs via the network. Um, and I al already mentioned the learning agreements, but here uh, the interoperability issues are, are less pertinent. Um, and also the numbers are increasing uh, rapidly. However, there are also some uh, still some challenges, especially regarding inter-institutional agreements. Uh, in spite of the of the progress we we uh, saw during the last couple of months, we still face uh, issues. Um, and at the time of publication of this report, um, one of the findings is that five providers out of sixteen do not yet meet interoperability requirements. Um, the, the technical testing and, and the contacts um, that we have um, already indicate that one more provider needs to be ready very soon. And of course, we continue working with all, all providers uh, in order to, to achieve this goal of uh, seamless data exchanges also for uh, interinstitutional agreements. The most affected countries are um, Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, and Austria. Um, here, it, our, our, our threshold was about 20% um, of institutions um, that are working with one of the providers that are not yet fully compliant in order to exchange interinstitutional agreements. Um, at least it gives some idea about um, where exchanges should happen seamlessly. Um, which is also the, the case, for example, when you exchange with another dashboard user. It's also important to stress that the EWP team has uh, identified key steps and solutions in order to overcome uh, those challenges and, and the fact that we are not yet seamlessly exchanging with some implementations. And this, of course, has also been shared with, with uh, the, the concerned providers. Um, but it also means that um, we have good hope that in, in, in the time uh, ahead of us, that uh, we will vastly improve the IAA exchanges for more than 80% of the affected higher education institutions. Of course, this is um, with a small asterisk that uh, the affected providers need to, to, to make some improvements and implementations. And this also doesn't happen overnight, of course, we are all aware um, when speaking about technical issues, um, we need some time in order to, to um, solve them. Um, it's also clear from the consortium perspective, also from the perspective of, of the European Commission, that uh, decisive action is needed um, regarding the 320 higher education institutions that are currently connected, but their provider uh, cannot ensure an adequate exchange of interinstitutional agreements uh, data. This also affects many other nodes in the network who are exchanging with those 320 higher education institutions. And in order to uh, discuss what kind of actions um, that we are working on, um, I would be pleased to pass the floor to Harpa, um, who is the relationship manager um, working at the team in EAC and also part of the consortium. Uh, to also uh, discuss this a little bit because she will be uh, the main uh, gateway, I, I would say, between the consortium commission and also the, the third party providers. Yes, thank you so much, Zhao. Uh, thanks for passing the floor to me to discuss this very important topic. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased that thanks to the uh, action plan and the assessment report, we can now really pinpoint uh, what are the affected nodes and which institutions are affected. Um, even though it is a minority of universities that are facing this problem right now, um, the multiplying effect is, is enormous and in the end it, it affects uh, all of their partners. So it's very important that we now focus our efforts until the end of the year to ensure that those universities are also using a correct implementation of EWP and then uh, equally important, or if not more important, also make sure how can we avoid that we enter this situation again with any further um, add-ons to the system, uh, other business processes that we want to support in the future. Um, so how will we do this? Well, 
as has already been mentioned by several colleagues, we've had technical workshops, we have a technical forum where we're discussing with uh, third party providers and, and technical teams inside universities so that we can find common ways to, to solve any remaining technical issues. And then we are putting in place a team of relationship managers. Uh, actually, we will be three colleagues in total that have been given the role to, um, based on the latest data, set up a list of priority meetings of universities and third party providers that we will um, discuss with to make sure that the problems are solved and the implementation is correct and it answers the needs of the end users. Here, I think what is very important is that the relationship managers all have background in mobility coordination. So in fact, we are the end users that can provide support in terms of ensuring that the implementation really fits the needs of universities. And it is being truly compliant with the interoperability requirements. Um, and what has already been mentioned uh, several times is that moving forward, we need to see what actions we need to take and what uh, rules perhaps need to be put in place for the use of EWP to make sure that uh, the implementation is um, correct on the ground. And we don't have the feeling that the system is not working when in fact there are some problems on the ground with specific implementation. So I think we haven't taken any concrete decision yet how we will make this happen. But again, now thanks to the governance structure and perhaps thanks to the relationship managers, we will be able to discuss this issue and put a solid plan in place at the start of 2023 to make sure that this uh, issue does not repeat itself in the future. We are, of course, completing now the technical work on the collection of statistics and error logging, which will provide, well, the commission, the consortium, as well as national agencies and universities, even better information to be able to understand at all times if there is a problem, what is the source of the problem and how we can focus our efforts to really make sure that that problem is addressed as soon as possible. Um, so yes, indeed still, we need to ensure that um, all universities are able to conclude agreements without any interoperability issues by the end of 2022. And then if there are any remaining problems, we certainly hope not. But in case any university is still facing a technical problem, we can activate the relationship managers to reach out and have set up bilateral meetings to make sure that the problems are overcome and uh, issues are reported to the right forum to make sure that they are addressed quickly. So uh, in the end, I just want to say uh, thank you so much for all of the work that you've done. And also I'm very excited to take on this role and, and use my background in mobility coordination to make sure that the system is also catering as best as it can to the end users as soon as possible, because I think that we all believe in this initiative and we know that it can be a total game changer if we get it right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Harpa. And I see a lot of thumbs up and hearts on the screen. So it uh, seems that uh, the community also is uh, very happy with, uh, with, with you and the relationship managers in order to uh, have uh, good working relations with uh, third party providers as well. Uh, so very happy to see that. Um, we also have some, some more practical advice uh, for, for the IROs themselves, um, which is um, actually we identified indeed um, that not each and every higher education institution can already exchange uh, inter-institutional agreements and learning agreements um, seamlessly. However, a large majority of, of institutions is already connected. And um the, the the tip i can i can give also based on feedback from colleagues um that 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 already were quite successful and had percentages of above 50 percent of of inter-institutional agreements already approved is to really focus on on what works because i'm sure that um all of you dashboard users when you try to exchange an inter-institutional inter agreement with another dashboard user they should uh, work seamlessly without any interoperability issues. So you can already get part of the work done. We can rely, of course, like Jan Meil indicated, on, on, the, on the email confirmations and, and paper agreements. But in the end, they should all become digital. And of course, 
we are now at the phase for the 2023-24 mobilities that we want to secure the mobility spots. So even now we, we can already um, try to complete the agreements online and then we are sure and secure that it will last until the, the end of the program that we have the agreement in place. Uh, so I think it's it's also uh, important to, to, to focus on what works. Um, you might also have exchanged with, a, with an in institution that is using a, a third party uh, software. If this process works well, it will probably also work for other institutions using the same software. Um, and you could use the EWP stats portal for more information uh, because there you can find uh, what system is in use um, at, at what institution. So this is something you can already uh, do today, tomorrow, next week, next month. Um, but also um, beginning of 2023, preparing the call for, for mobilities in the, 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 the next academic year, because um, of course, when we, when we um, focus on this kind of exercise um, ahead of opening the call, it, it's a lot of work given the many agreements that, we're all, that we all have. Um, there, there's a new approach, a completely new approach uh, when it comes to, um, to setting new targets. Uh, Jan Meil already referred to that. It's very important that uh, the technical specifications um, are also combined with the mandatory business requirements. Um, we also uh, think it, it would be good uh, to have an implementation threshold. Um, therefore, we, we're putting into place uh, some robust testing um, mechanism. And then it's a, a decision um, by the Commission after consultation with the, 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 the several governance bodies where the community um, is represented. To conclude, um, there are less issues for learning agreements than for interinstitutional agreements. Uh, EWP works. You remember that was the main question, whether or not EWP works. EWP works, but uh, some critical notes do not yet work. However, we are uh, working with those notes in order to make sure um, that as soon as possible, they also um, have a, a, a good implementation in place. So we can seamlessly exchange with everyone in the network. Um, and by the end of 2022, we aim to eradicate issues um, as, as said before. The EWP assessment report is available for the time being on the EWP Competence Center, but it will also be added at the SK portal uh, soon. Um, which, uh, like Jan Meil and Vanessa stressed, uh, is the main gateway to find information about uh, the European Student Card Initiative and its building blocks. And EWP, Erasmus Our Paper, is one of those building blocks. So this will, of course, also become part of the official uh, documentation there. But uh, Jan Meil also already addressed that this is a bit of work in progress. Um, so more and more information will be added there, and you will also be able to find the EWP uh, assessment report via the, that link. And that was my final slide. I hope, I'm sure I'm a little bit over time. I hope the colleagues won't mind and can also um, further continue and share their presentations. Uh, thank you for that, Paul. I think it was a very necessary item or segment, so I don't think there's a time issue. Um, in the Q&A, we've seen a lot of questions popping up regarding the dashboard and the roadmap for the dashboard, future enhancements, etc. So with that in mind, I'm very happy to announce or introduce the next speaker, uh, who is Kostas Karaoglanoglu from uh, the University of Thessaloniki and head of the development team for the AOP dashboard, um, who will answer some of the questions or provide uh, some more details on many of the questions that were asked regarding the dashboard. So welcome, Kostas. Hope you can hear me. Yes, I can. Hello, everyone. David, give me uh, one moment to share my screen. No problem. OK, I'm all good, right? Yes, I can see your screen. Okay. All right, thank you. The floor is yours, Kostas. Hello, everyone. I'm Kostas from the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. 
I'm um, leading the developments in the EWP dashboard along uh, with team members from the university. Um, I, I'm here today to share um, a progress update on the developments of the EWP dashboard and follow up on uh, stuff that I've presented in the in the previous uh, webinars. Now, before uh, going into um, uh, the details uh, of the progress update in the WP dashboard and then share some good news about the timeline for rolling out UI and UX improvements. I would like to start in a kind of an unorthodox way and uh, uh, pinpoint uh, other work that uh, the consortium has done in the ecosystem but uh, this work is also really very relevant to the to the WP dashboard uh, users. The European Student Identifier. Uh, there were also other speakers that have lightly touched upon uh, the issue uh, in this uh, webinar. The European Student Identifier is a digital identifier enabling students to uniquely identify themselves when they access student mobility services online. Uh, the identifier supports and eases international student mobility and transnational cooperation of higher education institutions. It will allow IT systems to link information shared via the WP to the right student without a need for any human manual intervention. I think that Vanessa has already stated that this is going to be a requirement uh, from 2023 uh, onwards, uh, and this has been communicated to the national agencies also. Um, and of course, we are always making sure that no students and no haze are left behind. Uh, but uh, please uh, take some time to, to check if you issue the European Student Identifier from your institution. Now, um, what is the use case and where, where is the European Student Identifier? How is it going to be used? When the home university nominates a student digitally via WP, the ESI will be included in the information sent to the host institution. When the host institution receives a learning agreement, ESI will enable linking this LA to the rightful nominated student. And at the end of the mobility, a transcript of records will be sent digitally from the host to the home institution. And once again, ESI will be used to identify the student at the home university. It's basically an identifier that's gonna tie all the relevant documents that um, are issued uh, during uh, student uh, mobility. Now, what, what you can do about this to check if you issue it and if you don't to proceed in issuing the European Student Identifier. Uh, first of all, this task is, um, uh, is a task where the IT team of the university needs to be involved. So make sure that you reach out to the to the IT team and uh, pinpoint uh, this uh, requirement. And I've also included the technical information from the Giant Wiki uh, with information, with more technical information about the European Student Identifier. The WP admin role. This role has been defined to enable authorized representatives of higher education institutions participating in Erasmus Plus activities to log in in a federated manner to EWP tools to manage their EWP information and settings. Why is the EWP admin role uh, important? Because the WP admin role is currently utilized by the registration portal. I'm, I'm not sure uh, how many of you are familiar with the functionality of the registration portal. It's, it is the place where the EWP administrator, uh, representative of, uh, of an institution, is basically uploading the manifest files to make, uh, to make their node in the network uh, accessible by other partners in the network. This is currently utilized uh, in the registration portal now, and there is also provision for this EWP admin role to be utilized by the EWP dashboard in the future for authentication uh, purposes.
Now, again, this task is a task where the IT team of the university needs to be involved, needs to be involved. So please reach out to, to, to your IT teams and uh, inform them about this. And I've also, again, included the same way I had for the slides uh, for the European Student Identifier, the technical information about the EWP admin role and how it should be issued uh, from the Yant uh, wiki page. The WP stats portal, which is also, it should be very interesting from, from an IRO's perspective. It provides stats, info, and useful insights for the data exchanges in the WP network. Uh, its URL is this one, stats.erasmus without paper, dot eu and i don't know if i have some time to actually go and browse a bit in the stats portal and and uh, showcase uh, some uh, some of, of its functionality david i think i'll go for it uh, is my chrome tab still visible uh, yes i can see your screen still uh, but uh, you can see the, the stats portal, right? I see, yes, I can see the stats portal. Okay, thanks. Now, uh, the landing page of the stats portal has a search bar. It has uh, two active sessions, the filtering options and the charts uh, session. And this monitoring section is currently not available, but it will come soon. Now, how can you uh, utilize um, and uh, get uh, insights from, from the EWP stats portal as IROs? First of all, you can browse the chart section and actually see statistics about interinstitutional agreements, numbers, statistic numbers, right? Uh, for the interinstitutional agreements, for the outgoing learning agreements, for the incoming learning agreements. You can also aggregate them based on country and per provider. These are nice views. And it will be helpful I guess to to all the IROs to 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 come uh, browse the portal and take a look in the in the mm -hmm. statistics. Okay, now back to the landing page. You can also search, for instance, I'm going to find all the Greek institutions. There are. <clears throat> These are all the Greek, the Greek institutions, right? Uh, there are also some detailed info about the institution, about the partner participating in the network, in the WP details. Uh, th this is a, a dashboard uh, client. It's a university in Athens. Which APIs they have implemented? Other stuff that you can find here. is uh, all the relevant data sources for this university listed here. And uh, this uh, uh, this stats portal, uh, its development is, is ongoing and uh, more stuff are going to, to be presented here also. Back to the presentation. Now, Let's drill into details about uh, EWP dashboard development. We have a major ongoing task of maintaining the EWP dashboard services. And what does this mean? Th this means that we are ensuring that the EWP dashboard connector is the component that handles the exchanges via the EWP network, is functional and operational, uh, ensuring a smooth exchange of data in the EWP network. Considering the EWP dashboard's magnitude in the network, we are working relentlessly in keeping with the responsibility of being the reference implementation. Uh, what does this being the reference implementation entails? We are basically uh, facilitating testing procedures with 
all the other partners in the network. The EWP dashboard is the primary testing partner when implementations of third-party providers or in-house solutions wish to test the EWP network exchange. Testing, as I've previously stressed in other webinars, is vital to maintain an adequate level of quality in exchanges in the EWP network to avoid problematic nodes and implementations entering the network, deteriorating the quality of exchanges. Apart from testing with uh, uh, newly uh, with uh, with nodes that wish to join the EWP network, we are also uh, spending a lot of effort in proactive debugging, which was also mentioned before in the webinar. Now, what does this mean? Uh, we are proactively identifying issues in other partners' implementations that deteriorate the quality of exchanges in the production network. And as the EWP dashboards development team, as the reference implementation, we are actively informing, reaching out to partners, liaising with them and guiding them, hopefully guiding them towards uh, the light. This, this whole task has been established by this interoperability reinforcement plan that uh, other colleagues have, uh, have mentioned already. Now, let's go to the good stuff. You remember that we started in the beginning of 2022 uh, by having a, a, a major UX research survey that all dashboard users have participated in, right? We gathered all this feedback. Uh, we have designed the improved UI UX mockups. We have shared them with you in a, in a previous uh, webinar. and. We are now, the past couple of months, we are in the implementation phase of uh, the improved UI UX of the WP dashboard services. What is the state of play now for the WP dashboard services? I'm happy that I can share with you a tentative timeline for rolling out these improvements. The implementation is on schedule. <clears throat> Probably it is kind of ahead of the schedule. And we are uh, we are now in the in the position to to start planning the the, the transition approach for these improvements. Um, the way that we, we are handling this is by going for a soft transition approach rather than a, an abrupt switch to the improved uh, front end, right? And we are planning uh, for it to happen in two phases. The phase one that, that um, uh, can start in early December is about nominations and learning agreements. Uh, we are planning to have both of these sections, functionalities in the WP dashboard services, fully accessible from, the, from, from, from both UIs, uh, the old one and the improved one, to facilitate transition for the majority for the majority of the functionalities, and of course to give to the to the dashboard users to to our community um, a, a soft way of getting acquainted with uh, with uh, the the new front end. Okay, uh, this we are going to kick start it in early December, right? It's the phase one for the nominations and the learning agreements sections and functionalities. Now for the phase two, which is planned in the end of December, there are there some technical constraints and structural changes that make this dual environment approach that we are taking for the nominations and the LAs, uh, make this, this soft uh, dual environment approach technically challenging. What we plan to do there is consider a phase, a, a feedback phase after phase one, right? Uh, and the new IIA UX and functionality will be available directly on the on the new environment. So you will have in phase one some time to get acquainted with the new uh, uh, front end and uh, uh, manage nominations and learning agreements. And as we move closer to the end of the December, right? We are going to, to switch to the new environment for, for the IIAs. This is the, the, the timeline for rolling out the improvements. 
thank you very much for the attention. Thank you, Costas, <clears throat> for the presentation and uh, for the updates. I think it was um, welcomed by many, uh, given the many questions in the Q and A. Um, Ho hopefully, David, I managed to answer some of the questions in the Q A section with this presentation. Yes, yes, I, I, I think you, you did. Um, and people can always still um, submit ideas, request features, or follow up via the service desk. Uh, and luckily, the next item is an update from the service desk. Um, and, uh, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm happy to welcome Mikhailo Zanitels, um, who is a, an IT member from the, the service desk, and who will prevent, uh, provide us with some updates um, on, on the service desk's functioning. Um, Mikhail, one of the things that I, that I saw popping up in the Q&A a lot was people uh, wondering about uh, the response time um, when they submit a ticket. So maybe besides your presentation, that's also something that you can briefly uh, explain to the many viewers. Um, can you hear me? Yes, of course. Thank you. All right. I welcome David. you then. Um, so my name is Mikhail Zanetos. I am a member of the ESCI service desk. And uh, today I, I will um, present you with uh, some recurring tickets uh, that we are facing. So wait a minute. Uh, so um, I'm a member of the ESCI service desk, like I told you. Uh, there are three main uh, colleagues, uh, Vicky Penopoulou and Maria Chrysovergi and uh, Corina Labrevo. Um, so as you may already know, we provide support and uh, resolve issues related to the dashboard application, the OLA application, the Erasmus Plus app, the EWP network, uh, authorization and authentication issues in general, and uh, EWP interoperability issues. Uh, this is, these applications and services uh, are supported by the ESCI service desk found at uh, support.erasmuswithoutpaper.com. Uh, um, by choosing non-student issues allows the IRO to receive support uh, if you are facing difficulties and uh, need uh, assistance in technical problems, example, OLA or IAA issues. Uh, if you are having troubles uh, accessing our systems, example, the Erasmus dashboard, if you are looking for help and guidance in uh, using our services, if you want to suggest improvements uh, or you need a new account, for example, regarding your registration request for Erasmus dashboard. Um, we would like to take this opportunity um, to point um, out the most effective way to submit uh, a request in order to speed up the process. Um, always uh, report the Erasmus code of your institution. So if you're facing problems uh, accessing the dashboard itself or a specific um, sections of uh, the site. Uh, right, Michaelis, uh, we have a very tight agenda, so maybe you can have some time to look and we can move on to a next uh, item. Um, because we have shared a lot of information today uh, and a lot of updates, um, and as you know, we value also uh, a lot of your input. Um, I think we have prepared some a, a short survey with some questions um, regarding the many actions uh, that we're taking over the past month and the course that we are on and um, that we would like your input in. So I think um, I can uh, request support from Jan Mael Bido from the European Commission again to provide some input on, on, on the, the idea behind the questions and the rationale and then I can prepare the poll in the meanwhile. 
Thank you. Uh, yes, indeed, we have prepared a little poll uh, for you with uh, four different questions. Uh, we know that obviously everyone attending the seminar is uh, very interested in the topic of digitalization and Erasmus without paper. Everyone is very committed to make this initiative a success. And you have uh, heard a lot in this presentation that we want to listen more, we want to co-develop uh, this initiative with you, and this is also why we want to show you that we value your, your opinion as, as end users, and this is why we like to hear your views on a set of four different questions that I believe will appear uh, here exactly. Um, so based on everything you have just heard, uh, we invite you to reply to these uh, four little questions and give us our feedback on uh, the different aspects uh, they, they cover. So I'll leave you to answer the different questions. While we allow people some time to answer the questions, I can also uh, respond to some of the questions in the Q&A asking if the presentations will be available and if the recording will be available. As always, there will be an article um, published and shared with everyone where we will also attach the presentations. And we will also, uh, the recordings of the webinars are always available on the SQ YouTube channel. I don't see where we are at with the number of answers uh, that are provided um, in the poll. Yes, 40% um, of participants has answered up to those points. Um, I think people are, are taking their due diligence to go over the different questions. So you, you, you will see that the questions cover aspects uh, like the vision behind uh, Erasmus to that paper and the digitalization efforts it imply uh, the mm -hmm. uh, activities and the action taken the, the interoperability action plan uh, the need for a more uh, control or rule-based uh, EWP network and the uh, efforts for digitalization and the, the need to uh, further facilitate the, the work of everyone in this context. Uh, David, I would like to report that I'm ready to continue the presentation, if you want. <laughs> All right. Um, I, I, I don't know if we can do a presentation and a poll at the same time. I think we can close the poll at the... Um, the numbers are still going up. I think we're at around 60%. So. So if we give everyone a couple more minutes and then we can have a Michaelis uh, presentation. Yes, Michaelis, maybe you can already try to share your screen and set it up. Thank you, Jan Mael, for, for introducing the questions. All right, I can see your screen. Okay. All right, thank you everyone um, for answering the questions. Um, we will close them now um, and have let Michaelis present his presentation. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry for the interruption, but uh, it's Murphy's Law, you all know it. Uh, I will continue uh, where I have stopped before. So in order to uh, speed up the process of resolving the tickets, uh, we would like to present you with the most effective way to submit requests. Like I told you before, do not forget to report the Erasmus code of uh, your institutions. Uh, we can search for it, but uh, it costs time. Every single action we do, it, it costs time. So the more info you provide to us, uh, the less uh, time we waste and we can um, um, focus on solving the problem itself. So if you have a problem, if you have a problem accessing uh, the dashboard itself or specific sections of the site, like I saw in the, in the questions now, uh, please share with us the account, uh, the email address that uh, you are trying to use. 
Uh, for IIA issues, please provide the ID of the IIA itself. And if it's not possible, uh, please provide us with the Erasmus code of uh, your partner institution as well. Uh, for OLA issues, uh, please provide us in an order of preference, the LA ID, uh, the student's email address, the student's name, if it's not possible. And finally, if you don't have access to any of the above info, uh, please provide us both of uh, the sending and the receiving uh, institutions Erasmus codes, and uh, we'll try to track the corresponding OLA. So let's uh, try to see the commonly received issues by now. Um, we often get requests for name, city, or address changes. Information that um, appears in the general info page inside uh, the dashboard, okay? This kind of information is taken uh, directly from uh, the ECHA list and uh, we cannot stray away for it, from it. Uh, so we kindly ask you to check your institution's uh, record in the ECHA list before submitting your request. In case your information is outdated, then in order to update it, please uh, inform the publisher of the list via the email address um, on your screen, the eacea -E at ec.europa.eu. Another common uh, question regarding the IIA list uh, is uh, how you can organize your IIAs in order to find the one that you are looking for. The status filtering option, as well as the partner uh, Hey Erasmus uh, code drop down list, have been improved uh, upon your suggestions. The Erasmus codes are now in al alphabetical order. You may combine more than one filters for more specific uh, results. For example, you may search for the IIAs that uh, have been exchanged by a specific partner institution during a specific uh, academic year. Or you may uh, see all the pending IIAs whose status remains in uh, approved by you. You can combine uh, filters however you want. Um, one common issue is uh, missing LAs from the institutions outgoing on or incoming students list, okay? So in order to understand why this behavior is happening, we should describe the negotiation flow of an OLA. First, the student signs the OLA, then the IRO of the sending institution signs it, and lastly, the IRO of the receiving institution signs it. If at some point an IRO rejects uh, the OLA, it will return directly to the student, meaning that it will disappear from the IRO's side. For example, let's say that a student signs an, IIA, an LA, I'm sorry. Uh, then the LA appears in the section of the sending institution, okay? So if the IRO of the sending institution rejects it, it will return to the student in order to correct it. And consecutively, it disappears from the dashboard, okay? It will reappear to the sending institution only after the student has resigned it. If it will appear to the receiving institution side, um, only when the, the sending, it will reappear to the sending institution site only if the IRO of the sending institution has actually signed it. And now it's the critical point. If the IRO of the receiving institution rejects the OLA, it will return to the student directly, meaning that it will disappear from the site of the sending institution as well. So at that point, the sending institution's IRO will see an OLA that has just disappeared and will think that it's an error. It's not an error. There's no problem at all. Once the student resigns the OLA, it will reappear in uh, your site. Um, many tickets relate to missing or wrong email notification regarding the LAs itself. 
Um, the email notifications are being sent to the email address provided by the student as the email address of the responsible person. In case the student does not fill correctly the above email address, you won't receive a notification or even worse, you will receive an irrelevant one. And you will think that you will have a, an LA, but you will not find it. That's because the student has uh, Googled probably uh, the, the, the contact of the, uh, the, of the sending institution, and uh, he found a similar uh, institution which has other email address. Regardless, if you receive the email uh, notification or not, you can always find the learning agreement in question in dashboard and proceed as usual. So it's not necessary to uh, receive the email uh, link. Uh, also, uh, from our experience, uh, we would we ask you to check uh, your spam folder as well because many times uh, our notifications end up there. Um, now, who receives the notifications regarding the LAs? As you may see, um, the student should provide contact information for the responsible person, which is mandatory. They can add contact information for contact person as well, but the email notifications are always being sent to the responsible person only. So make sure that the email address is that should have received the notification is properly filled under the field um, responsible person, responsible email, not contact email. Another common problem that users are facing regards the default institution's data inside the IIA. In order for your institution's default IIA data to appear inside IIAs, you have to go to the EWP settings page and save yes to the second uh, question, which says, do you agree that the dashboard represents um, for um, represents your higher education institution in the EWP network to exchange the static info for interinstitutional agreements with your partners? And I should point out that um, this problem is not um, mandatory for the signing of the IIA, which means that the signing process of the IIA may proceed as, uh, as normally, and uh, you may change the setting afterwards. Quite often, uh, dashboard users face difficulties editing an IIA or submitting the applied changes, okay? You should confirm that all required fields have been filled in before trying to move forward to the next page. Okay, as you can, as you may see in the screenshot, uh, if you leave um, require fill empty, like I show you here, then the next page is not active. Once you filled all the required fields, then the next page um, button uh, activates. Uh, the same applies in the multiple cooperation conditions. As you may see, be, be, be careful to fill in all required uh, data that are needed. For, for instance, you see in uh, the cooperation conditions, there are at least four required uh, fields. If all of them are uh, filled, then the add cooperation condition button will become active. Uh, pay attention to the total months per year per mobility, which does not, uh, which only shows once you um, choose the mobility type. Lastly, as you may see here, the submit IIA button is not active. Many users uh, believe, uh, think that they cannot submit the IIA because the button is not active. They forget that they have to press next page in order to view uh, the review of the IIA, and then they will be able to submit uh, the, the IIA. 
a great amount of tickets relates to the informative notification in red uh, the partner has not set an, I, I, an id for this iia therefore no actions are available at this point please notify your partner to respectively contact their provider um, so this uh, message is displayed when an iia is initiated by you and should be exchanged via the ewp network you you would not see this uh, message if you are exchanging IIAs with a dashboard institution. If you see it, though, please report it and we will fix it. Um, so it's an indication that the partner higher education institution has not set a local IIA ID yet. It disappears when the partner institution shares the local ID. So as we show you, it does not indicate a problem when the status of the affected IIA is either changed and signed by you or approved by you, okay? But it indicates a problem when the status of the affected IIA is either changed and signed by partner or approved by partner. Uh, if it's the latter case, please uh, comment to us and uh, we will um, please report it and we will. Um, um try will guide you through should you consider it a, an error message well it depends on the iia status uh, it should alert you only when the partner higher education institutions has handled the iia and it's your turn to review the iia again in such case you won't be able to successfully continue the sign process even if the edit and view and sign option uh, seem available. Unfortunately, it's not a problem that can be solved on uh, our side. So these cases, we kindly ask you to inform your colleagues in partner HCIs accordingly. So that's it. Um, thank you for your time. Um, I would like to ask you uh, an, a, a favor when you are, in order to speed up the process also, please um, break the tickets into smaller ones. Do not um, create an enormous uh, ticket uh, having all the problems that you have because uh, it's difficult to handle it. If the ticket breaks in, uh, in uh, smaller tickets, then uh, we can work in parallel with uh, my colleagues. Especially, uh, we are asking you to um, break tickets that affect different partner institutions. You may collect all the IIAs or OLAs that uh, affect uh, a single institution. If you are having IIAs and, and OLAs affecting other institutions as well, please uh, issue another ticket. Um, that's all. I don't know if you have any questions or not. <clears throat> Hi, guys. Only the one that I asked in the beginning um, regarding what's the like the standard time in which people can expect a response to their ticket, like in how many days on usually um, it happens. Um, we try to respond. Uh, the first response, we try to keep it uh, under two days. And um, the, 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 the resolution of the ticket, unfortunately, it's not, um, it doesn't depend on us uh, only because um, most of the tickets that um, are, needs a lot, a great uh, time um, affect uh, in third party institutions as well. So, we have to the, the, the communication is uh, kind of difficult but now that we have enabled a new function in the portal we think we, that uh, we would speed up the process um that's it that's that's the answer <laughs> all right thank you Mikhail, for the presentation um thank you also Right. Um, I'm going to close the poll and I think we can briefly share results as we are already over time.
Um, I think you should now be able to see the results of the poll, everyone. Um, we would like to thank everyone for voting for the poll. And, and, and I think the, the feedback on these questions is very important to, to get a feel on, on how things are interpreted, how do you consider things are going. Um, I think we will also, given that uh, I see a lot of questions in the chat regarding the service desk and uh, requesting the email information, we will share uh, that as part of, of uh, the follow-up of the webinar. Um, and as always, um, you can still find a lot of information, as mentioned, on the new ESCI portal and as well on more specific uh, items uh, on the, the wiki pages. Um, so I would like to thank all the speakers for coming today. Um, I think it was a very inform informative meeting. I think that you can see that we are we have been taking many actions over the course of the last months and that on specific parts we are making progress. Um, and I think that's that's kind of the message I want to send today. Um, you can also expect us to keep pushing out articles and communications. One thing that, as mentioned um, by Jan Mael and by Vanessa, are the digital champions and examples of best practices. So uh, there's much more that you can expect for us over the coming months. And we can we want to thank you for, for being here. Um, and I know it's very, very early, but since it's the last webinar, webinar of the year, um, we want to wish everyone also a happy end of the year period and, and, and a good, uh, over the coming months. So thank you, everyone, um, and see you next time.